Missions Day, Getting Family Right. This is what I want to talk to you about real quick this morning. Getting family right, because family is really important. If you look at John 10.10, it's where we begin today. Believing that God is allowing us to walk in the promise of John 10.10 10, that says Jesus came, the good shepherd came, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. abundantly. That's right. You see, you can have a lot of good things going on in your life. You can have the job that you've always wanted. You can make the money that you've always thought you needed to make. But if your family isn't right, if your home is full of contention, strife, and stress, then my friend, I have a message for you. You're not living the John 1010 10 life yet. Can you right. say amen? Right. You see, family is really important. It's vital, it's critical, and it's time for all of us to get family right in the house of God. Now, I'm a pastor at heart. I love the Word of God, and I love God's people. And one of the things that I know as a pastor is that we need to teach our people about grace. We need to teach our people about love. We need to teach them about faith, mercy, and end times, prayer, prosperity, and the prophetic. All of those things are important. Everybody say amen. amen. But what I have come to see in our churches as we travel throughout this nation and around this world, and as I hear the struggles that pastors are encountering in their churches today, it's very clear to me that we do not give enough time to teaching on how to do family right. There's a way to do family, friends, and the Bible shows us. You see, the church is comprised of families. If our families are weak, so goes the church. Right. You don't have any choice. If our churches are weak, so goes our nation. Right. If families are weak, the church is weak. And if the church is weak, then missions, the evangelization of the world suffers. It's like a domino effect, friends, and it all begins right here in the house of God with family. Right. Somebody say it's time to get family right. It's time to get family right. You see, the blessings, the anointings, the favor of God is upheld when we do not have family right, both in the spiritual realm as well as in the natural because the John 10.10 10 promise will not come as fully, it will not be as fruitful as it could be if we were doing family right. Now look at Genesis 12, verse 2. Here God made a promise to Abram. I love this promise. Now the Lord had said to Abram, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. How many of you believe that's right? right. In the Dominican Republic, we minister in Sisua. Sisua is where all the Israeli, all the Jews that were escaping Hitler, during, uh, when Hitler was murdering them all, they escaped. No other nation in the world took the Jews but the Dominican Republic. And they all settled right in Sisua where God took us. And that's why I believe that God is blessing us because God has an end time blessing for those who have blessed his people. Yes. And, and, and that's why I believe that God is doing so much with it. And, and then it ends and it says, And in you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, in Abram, there's a promise that all the families, all, everybody say all. Oh. All the families of the earth will be blessed. And I mean when God says all, he means all. Look at the first few words that God declares over Abram's life here. God says, and in thee, not around thee, not on thee, but in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God was saying, Abram, there's something up inside of you. There's something locked up in you, Abram, that can free families, that can deliver families, that can set the structure and set up families right and bless families. It's there. And when it comes to full manifestation, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, if you do a study of God's Word here, a careful study rever reveals that that which was locked up in Abram was a seed, and that seed was Christ. Right. And when Jesus Christ came and walked on this earth, died, buried in a tomb, and rose from the dead, 
all the families of the earth were blessed. Can you say amen? amen. But now look at what it says in Galatians 3.29. This is so cool. I get excited about the word. You get excited about the word. I get excited about, I get excited about hunting too. But I get excited about the word. It says here in Galatians 3.29, we're reminded that if we are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is so amazing because within Abraham, there was this seed, the big S, Christ, and then all of us. Yes. So you're not only the recipient of the promise of the blessings of all the family of the earth, you are, in fact, friends, one of the vessels that all the families in the earth shall be blessed by. Yes. And I can't think of any better explanation of that than missions. Come on. Through missions, you bless all the families of the earth. Come on, everybody shout amen. Amen. You move from being blessed to being a blessing. And all of us are called to be blessed, but all of us are called to be a blessing to the families of the earth. And in spite of all of our issues, and families have issues. Come on now, is there any family here that doesn't have an issue? I want to be a part of that family. All families have issues. In spite of all those issues, the blessing to be a blessing to all the families of the earth is still locked up inside of you. You see, it doesn't matter if you came from an unchurched background like I did. It doesn't matter if you came from a, a family that wasn't all that great like I did. It doesn't matter how dysfunctional your family was like mine was. Right now, locked up inside of you resides the blessings that God spoke over Abram. And in him is the seed that all the families of the earth will be blessed. You are blessed and you are called to be a blessing. Yes. You want to be blessed, then you better move out to be a blessing. Can you say amen? So, you are the example in all the earth of how family is supposed to get done. You can go to college, you can get edumacated. You can become a nuclear physicist. You can become an expert in renewable energy, an expert in physiology, medicine, and economics. But there is one thing that man cannot teach you, and that's how to get family right. Families are a God design. Families are a God plan. Families are a God arrangement. He started it, he anointed it, and he's the one who can keep it. Look around at you, church. Look outside the four walls of this place. Look at the world that you live in. This world doesn't understand how to do family. That's true. It's true. Outside of God, it's impossible to get family right. Sure, the world's come up with some good ideas. They have some, written some kind of cool books, but Really, friends, when you get down to it, they're incomplete and they fall disastrously short because only God can teach us how to get family right. And one way he does this is through your example. It's not maybe, it's not possibly, but it's through your example. And your example is either going to be a good one or it's not going to be so good. Right. Because in you is the potential to show the whole world how families supposed to be done. Look at Psalm 68, verse 5, would you please? It's on the screen. Psalm 68, verse 5. We need to understand that you are not called to do this thing alone. I'm going to read it in a second. You're not called to do family alone. That's what this world has been trying to do for years, and look what it's gotten them. God set up the families, both natural and in the spiritual, to help you do family. And if in, like my case, friends, the natural fails you, then God provides for us a spiritual family that God has put us in place, put in place for us specifically to help you. You see, that's another reason why, friends, we need to be connected to the church. Right. It's not for the pastor's ego. Right. Not for us, it's for the people of God. You need to be connected to the church, the family of God, because there are no homeless people in the kingdom of God. For God has a home for you. He has a set place that he's prepared right here in this house for you. Can you say amen? amen. Secondly, God, 
The set place is an environment ordained by God to assist you in your spiritual growth and in a way that is specific to your destiny path. You see, families, as families, we've got to go through some things. And although you may not have grown up in a good family, if you're here this morning, you're in one right now. You're in one right now. You see, there are parallels between the natural family and the spiritual family that we really need to recognize. The Scripture refers to us as the household of God, the household of faith. And God wants us to see that these two work in parallel, friends, recognizing how successful households should operate in the spiritual also works in the natural realm. One of the interesting things is, is we don't get to pick family. Right. <laughs> think about it. We don't get to pick family. I think of all the weird members in my family, and all of you that are laughing are too. Not my family, your family. You've got some pretty strange characters too. I know it. I know it because everybody does. I, I remember when people would come to my church and we'd have these fellowships every few months and we'd have new people come into the church and, and they'd, how did you end up coming to Metropolitan Tabernacle? And they'd say, well, we drove by this place, I can't tell you how many times, and we didn't want to come here. <laughs> That's a real encouragement. <laughs> but God told us we had to come here. So we came here and we enjoy it. We love it. Now, I, I know some believers that I would rather not be in relationship with. <laughs> and some of you do too. Yet God even has a plan for putting us in relationship with those people too. Think about it. Everyone has a relative they don't want to admit is the relative. But God has a purpose for that relative being in your family. Listen, to know your rights is to accept your role, and to fulfill your responsibilities in the, in the family is to understand, friends, that you have a responsibility to the house. You see, somebody here right now is waiting for you to be what you're supposed to be to them. I've heard people come into church say the music's too loud. I don't like the worship. You know what, Nate? If they don't like the worship here, they're deaf. <laughs> the pastor won't do things the way I believe they should be done. Oh, I'm just not getting fed. I pastored for 20 years. I've heard all these lame excuses. You see, I'm getting too comfortable with you today, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. And in rebellion, those individuals sit in church, arms folded, never enter into worship with an attitude on their face, and they complain that they don't feel the Spirit of God, and they never receive anything from God. Golly, I wonder why. I wonder why. You see, the church doesn't evolve around you. The church exists for you, but it doesn't evolve around you. Somebody here this morning is waiting for you to go to them and introduce yourself to them. Amen. Somebody here this morning is waiting for you to go to them and find out that you have common interests, common experiences, that you love to go hunting together, oh. some common objectives, visions, and direction for your life. Somebody here this morning is waiting for you to come to them and help them, to stand with them, to kneel with them at this altar, to pray with them, and to encourage them as they fight the good fight of faith. Yes. Somebody's waiting for you. Somebody's waiting for you to be a true brother or sister to them in the household of God. Psalm 68, let me finally read it to you, verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender to the widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. In other words, God has a set place for you, a seat in his house just for you, to help you. The message version says, says it this way. I love the message. It says it this way. God makes homes for the homeless. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. The message says God leads prisoners to freedom. 
Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. But the rebellious, there are those that are rebellious. They dwell in a dry place. The message says they rot in hell. I don't want to be there. Come on. Here's seven quick promises to the family members of the house of God. God promises to provide for you provision. Here's what God said. God will provide. God will make sure that there's just what you need in the house when you're in the right house. Right. You may not pick the house. You might, amen. You may not pick the church. You may not like it all the time, but it's still provision, and it's exactly where God wants you. Next, to protect you. God has you protected in his house. Not only from that which seeks to harm you from the outside, but also to protect you from yourself. You see, most of the damage we experience in our lives is from that which we do to ourselves. Come Think on. about it. Right. That which we do to ourselves through self-destructive behaviors, from disobeying God's words and ways and ignoring the other members of the family who are specifically designed to make sure that you don't hurt yourself. As new parents, we did everything in our house to protect our children. I mean, my wife made me go to the store and buy all of those little cabinet locks. Right. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. I don't know about any of you guys, but I know I ripped at least one door off its hinges because I couldn't make that thing work. <laughs> and then I had to put sticky foam on all the sharp corners of everything through my house. My house looked like a zoo, but it was baby-proof. <laughs> and I thought we were past that when we moved down to Florida. My kids are grown up and they're gone, but there's something called grandchildren. Yes. And grandparent world is the greatest place to live. You know it. Until my wife says, cabinet door locks. Right. Get the sticky foam out. Yep. When I was out in California a few years ago, I bought this redwood tree slab. And then I bought the redwood root system, you know, that went with it. And, and I sent it back to Florida. When I got home, I sanded it down. I stained it, and I, I, I put a lacquer on it. It was beautiful. It was the centerpiece of our living room. It was our, our, our coffee table. But it had all these sharp edges and points on it and everything. My wife called it the table of death. <laughs> When my grandson came along, she made me take it out of the house. It's out of there. It's still gone. I still don't. Listen, this shepherd of this house goes to great lengths to teach you, friends, the word to protect you. That's right. To protect you from things that are from without and to protect you from yourself. Amen. And from, to keep you from messing with stuff that you ought not to be messing with. Somebody say amen. amen. Third, to prepare you for life and ministry. Man, that's a whole message in itself. To provoke you. Fourth, to provoke you. There are people in the house of God who God has designed, anointed, and filled with the Holy Ghost to annoy you. <laughs> it's the truth. I may be one of them to challenge you, to provoke you, to do what you're supposed to be doing for him. And they are designed with a hypodermic word. Hypodermic means to get under the skin. A hypodermic word that will get under your skin and irritate you until you are obedient to his word. It's only then that the ratch goes away, friends. <laughs> Ever since Pastor Richard gets up here, every time he gets up to preach the word, that gives hope and challenges us to break out of our self-imposed limitations and prisons. God is blessing you. That's right. Next, to propel you, to give you the power that you need to fulfill God's calling in your life. You see, if you'll sit still long enough to be taught, a lot of us, when we get our nose out of joint because somebody preached something that was right where we're living, yeah. We get mad and we take our toys and we leave the church and go somewhere else. If you'll sit long enough to be taught, to be sharpened, to let the family teach you some truth. Psalms 127 says the children are arrows in the hand of a mighty man. 
I'm a child of God, friends, designed and equipped to be propelled like an arrow to pierce the darkness and fulfill my destiny in him. Yes. But if I won't sit long enough to be taught, right. if I won't submit myself to the teaching of the word and to the man of God that God has placed in my life, I'm going to be like an arrow that goes two feet and drops to the ground. Right. God promises you a prayer covering here. A family prays for you like no one else can pray for you. What do you mean? Listen, no televangelist, no author, no parachurch ministry can pray for you like your family can. Why is that? Because your family cares for you. Well, he cares for me. He doesn't even know your name out there in TV land. How can he care for you? I'm sure he cares for the body of Christ. But your family knows you, and they can pray in truth for you, what you need rather than what you want. Right. Remember Peter and John as they approached the gate beautiful. The lame man was there, and he was begging for alms, silver and gold, silver and gold. Peter and John, they didn't give him what he wanted because that would have only met a temporal need. Peter and John gave him what he needed. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You see, your family can pray for you what you need rather than what you want. Amen. Lastly, a privilege. It's a privilege and honor to be a part. Yeah. That's right. You see the little kids I deal with every year in the Dominican Republic. They have sugarcane fields. And in the sugarcane fields, the orphans live. Those kids would, man, they would give everything, anything to be a part of a family that would discipline them, that would take them in and allow them to be a part of their family. Family is an honor and a privilege to be a part of. It's a privilege to know that you're flanked by others who will worship you, who will believe with you and join in prayer with you and fight the powers of darkness on your behalf. Listen, God has designed the family to help you come out of things. Right. Huh? That's right. The message version, Psalm 68, verse 6 says, God leads prisoners to freedom, but the rebellious to a dry land. Right. Wow. God has designed the family to help you come out of things. Oh, but I don't have anything I need to come out of, Pastor. Whoa, really? You could be a member of the pride family. <laughs> because the Bible says that we're all shaped in iniquity. In other words, we arrived here. We were born with issues, friends. Right. We didn't have to learn any. We were born with them. We were born with a sin nature that carries all kinds of actions and attitudes that will ultimately destroy us unless submitted to Christ. And oftentimes through our Christian walk, that it raises its head in our lives. God gave us a family to see those issues, friends, and to introduce you to the only one that can deliver you, and his name is Jesus. Amen. Now, those issues aren't cute when they're little. I mean, Richard, you were just... You were chewing on that kid's cheeks, man, while he was sleeping. Right. How many of you saw that? You're guilty. They are so cute. And even when they get old enough to start, you know, crawling around, and when they say no for the first time, they're so cute. <laughs> Wait until they're 12 years old. And they say no. It's like you want to grab them and bless them. Jesus, help me find somebody. Nate, I'm sorry. Can you help me? Please. Now, here's the thing. I, a little toddler can be cute when they say no. But when your kid becomes 12 years old or becomes 6 foot 2, and they say no, it's not so cute anymore. <laughs> Listen... You saw my head going to and fro, searching for someone who wasn't too terribly big. <laughs> and uh, I found him. <laughs> Smart families cut off the flesh early. They don't let flesh grow in their kids' lives. They don't let that nonsense grow in the kids' lives because when they get old, it's not so cute anymore. That's right. And eventually, left unchecked, it will grow out of the control 
and get big. It's even tougher when a parent enables flesh to grow in their kids' lives. Right. Right. Listen, parents, when you raise your children making excuses for them like my mother did us when they were our little and do everything for them and then bankroll their ungodly behaviors and then go rescuing them from the situations that they have caused for themselves, you are enabling flesh to grow. That's right. You're enabling flesh to grow and flourish in their lives. And friends, if unchecked, if not cut off, it will eventually destroy them and they will have you to thank because God didn't call you to be their buddy. God called you to be their parent. I talked, I talked to a parent the other day. It's a pastor, in fact, whose daughter is in college. And he said, yeah, my daughter lost 10 pounds last week. I said, is she trying to lose 10 pounds? I, incidentally, I have lost some weight. I am not sick. I'm just getting fit for my wife. Come on. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I talked to a parent the other day whose, whose daughter is in college. She did lose 10 pounds in one week, and she wasn't trying to lose weight. What happened is, is she went a week and a half without a meal. And I said, well, well why is that? He said, because she went out and bought a pair of jeans instead of buying food. I was so proud of this man. I wanted to kiss him and hug him. But I re refrained. She went out and bought a pair of jeans instead of buying food for the week. The consequences was this. Number one, she didn't eat for a week and a half. And number two, her new jeans didn't fit. <laughs> I love it. You know what happened? She learned how to prioritize because daddy didn't come running to her aid. Can you say amen? amen? The family is here to help you come out of things. The family is here to help you cut off the flesh. Okay, help me here. Step up here if you would, please. Jump on. Uh, <laughs> you're heavier than the other guy the other night. Muscles, uh, muscle weighs more than fat. You know? Okay, I got you, yeah, muscle. Yeah, this guy's talking to me, muscle. I got to see my notes. Okay, with all this flesh on my back, I can probably get from point A to point B. Come on, quit sliding down. <laughs> quit laughing because I got to make this. Okay, so with all this flesh on my back, I can't, I can get from point A to point B, but I can't get there really good. I'm walking a little bit difficult. Probably going to need to see a chiropractor after the service. I'm not as nimble as I could be if I didn't have all this flesh, all this excess junk on my back. But see, when you're carrying all this flesh around, you can't be what God wants. You can't run the race like God called you to run. You can't fight the fight when you've got all this junk on your back. Somebody say, get the flesh off. Get the flesh off. Yeah, turn to somebody else. Say, get the flesh off. Thank you so much. I got to get my breath. I'm 60 years old, man. This is not easy anymore. I got to come up with a new message. <laughs> You see, when we become captive to our own flesh is when we don't listen to the word and to the family that's placed in our lives to help us. That's right. We've got to get family right. That's right. Verse 6 says, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Those who refuse and resist the authority of the word of God and the help of the family dwell in a dry land. I learned more about how to handle money when I was broke. You see, even difficult experiences teach us something. That's right. They should. I have a saying that I've, I've repeated over the years. Parents, never rob your children of their God-given right to poverty. Come on. 
Never rob your children of the God-given right to poverty. Just don't hand money over to them fist over fist. Listen, listen, instead of enabling them to continue down the destructive path, let them learn. Debbie and I learned how to stretch a dollar best when we had no dollars at all. Right. Let them learn, my friends. Let them learn so that someday they'll be able to save some dollars. Don't write off all your family's experiences because they weren't all peachy and great. My family experiences, I really can't remember a whole lot of good family experiences. My dad was the head of the lab at Crescer in Detroit. We came from an upper middle class family. I mean, I would say that it was, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was an above average, quote unquote, economic family, but my, my, my life was miserable. I could write that all off, but that would be rebellion. You see, you can learn from the difficult experiences in your life, and to write those experiences off is rebellion. Look at Genesis 18, 18. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. That's what it says in Genesis 12. For I have known him in order that, I may command, that he may command his children and his household after him, that they, that they keep that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he, in other words, God, has spoken to him. God said, Abraham, up in Abraham is the foundation and the structure of family that I want to get out and understood in all of the earth. You see, Adam didn't get it right. Cain and Abel, they blew it. Cain murdered his brother, then said, am I my brother's keeper? You better believe you're your brother's keeper. Can you say Amen. What God was saying here is that in Abraham, there is an order, there is a structure that's going to make the family blessed in all the earth. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, this is where I'm going to need a little bit of help. I'm gonna, I've already talked to a few people, and two of them are Abraham, are, uh, Abraham Benjamin and Rebecca. Can you guys help me? Do, or are you strapped with the little one? Uh, if, if the little one... if it's all right. If the little one starts getting a little rambunctious, it's okay. Now, I need one other uh, brother. Is it Mark? Is that your name? Mark? Mark, you look like the right one. Come on up and join me. Okay, you guys, would you come on over here for a minute? Um, Benjamin, I'd like you to stand on the second step. Uh, Rebecca, I'd like you to stand on the third step. And you, my brother, Mark, come on up here. Look at this guy. He looks like God. <laughs> Come on, you're God right here today. Today, You're God for a day. All right, so here it is. Actually, I'd like you to step up here on the second step. Okay, and what you see right here is, is really a, a, a beautiful reflection of, of, of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The family unit is supposed to be like this, but... But what you need to understand is, is that, and I'm sure that these two did, because they've got all these beautiful kids, and they're dedicating them to the Lord, that Benjamin and Rebecca understand that their marriage relationship is not just them two, but it's a love triangle between the, fa between the father and husband and wife. If Jesus isn't the center of their marriage at all times, their marriage will not be successful. Can you say Amen. Now, I'd like you to step right down here, please, if you would, Rebecca. And there's a few other kids that we've asked for help for. Uh, Pastor Kelvin came. Come on up here, you guys. Come on up here. Cool. We got some kids that are going to help us today because we want to show you what it is to have a family do family right. Okay. Come on up here, you guys. Come on up here. I'm going to have you. Uh, actually, I'm going to have you stand right here. And I'm going to bring you right here and you right here. Now, let's say here's God, here's father, mother, and three children. Give it up for the family. They look great. Sometimes it helps us to see that which we hear to fully understand truth. Can you say amen? To see it more clearly, thereby understanding how powerful the family unit is and how powerful this truth is in our lives today. So this is what we're going to do. Um, 
God said in Abraham, there is a command that I'm giving to the family, a structure that I want to lay out. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13 shows you that structure very clearly. Christ is the head of the man, right up here, this big guy. He's the head of the man. The man is the head of the wife. Can you say amen? amen. Don't get mad at me yet. <laughs> Together, <laughs> yeah, did you hear me say yet? Together, they provide leadership for the rest of the family. You understand that? Now, if you'll come up here and stand right here next to this man. Now, this is the way it's supposed to be. That they actually work together and they stand side by side in this marriage agreement together, in agreement with each other. And don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me yet. Because Benjamin says, I'll do all the cooking and cleaning. <laughs> He's a good man. He'd probably do it. But you see, Rebecca says, hey, listen, I'll take care of the inside of the house. I'll do the cooking, the cleaning. I'll take care of that stuff. You, you go to work, you know, make the money, the provision that we need to, to pay the bills and take care of the outside of the house and take care of all these other things out there. So what happens is, is that when you move into a marriage agreement, you discuss as husband and wife all of these things and you stand side by side. The agreement works because you stand side by side and God blesses the two because they are taking responsibility and they are making it work in their house. Can you say Amen. Because God commanded us, not suggested to us, God commanded us in Ephesians 5.21 before Paul's discourse on wives submit yourselves to your husbands and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Before that, God said that you're to, supposed to submit one to another. Right. So don't guys get up there in your male Neanderthal way and say, I'm the man of the house. Because you're just showing you're a moron. Did, did I say that? <laughs> I'm getting real, way too comfortable with this crowd. Okay, go ahead and stand back down there, if you would, please. What God wants us to see here this morning, and what I'm going to be finishing up with here in about the next seven minutes, if you'll give that to me, is that we need to understand that God wants us to see that there's a particular anointing that rests upon positioning. There is anointing that rests upon this positioning. And we miss it when we don't do family right. Here, I'd like you, Benjamin, come on over here. Stand over here, if you would. Stand right there. Okay. God said Christ is the head of the man. The man, the husband, is the head of the wife. She doesn't follow his direction because it's demanded of her. When it says here in this portion of Scripture that the husband is the head of the wife, the wife allows it to happen by her permission. Huh? Yeah, if you look at that word, it, that word is exousia, exousia, which means authoritative position, delegated or permitted authority. Meaning that she allows, she permits, in fact, she asks for the man to be the head. Because she wants to make sure that the alignment is right and proper so that they do family right in the house of the Lord and in their homes. And the husband understands that his position is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. No man hurts his own flesh. No man, no man. This is his own flesh. You open the car door for her, pull the car ch chair back for her. You speak in a tone of voice that denotes that she is the most important gift that you have ever received in your life, gentlemen. And every wise man said, Amen. Good, you get to watch football today. You buy her a card, you buy her flowers when she doesn't even expect it, when it's not her birthday. That's right. That's what you do. That's how you care for them. So here's, here's the thing.
If the house is in order and positioned correctly, Psalms 133 says how wonderful, how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil of, uh, uh, upon the head running down on the beard of Aaron, running down at the edge of his garments like the dew of Hermon, coming down from the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessings life forevermore. So when, so when Benjamin is standing here, there is an anointing that flows uninterrupted. Can you say Amen. So if the house is unified, there's an anointing that flows. In Fort Myers on the beach, there, I go there just when people come down to visit us, and we don't even go to the beach. We live there, but honestly, being a missionary is not just a four years, every four years of vacation. We work. And so I go to the beach when people come down, and when we go there, there's two parking meters. You've got to put your credit card in and then... Pr- Press in how many hours you want to be there, and then get the slip, put it in the front windshield of your car, and it sits there, and so it's all good. You can be on the beach for one, two, three, or five hours, whatever you paid for. One day we got there, there's only two in the whole parking lot, one right here and one about a quarter of a mile away. It's ridiculous. But we went to this one because we're parked next to it, and there's a whole line of people lined up there, and, and, and they're all... They're just waiting, and this guy's up there for like 10 minutes, and we're all looking at our watches, thinking, when are we going to get on the beach? And then we go up. I I thought, you know, what is going on? This guy's yelling at the parking meter. He's yelling at the parking meter. He's kicking it. He's cussing at it. He's swearing at it. He's actually slapping it. So I walked up there to see what was wrong. You know what was wrong? It said, out of order. (laughs) Come on, come on, Olivia, step over here. Step over here. Step up here, right there. You know what this is? Exactly. You can yell at it. You can kick at it. You can slap at it. You can cuss at it. But it ain't going to work because it isn't aligned. It isn't set up the way God set it up to produce what God promised to produce if it was in order. Can you say amen? Amen. Okay, everybody get back in order, even you, Dad. Everybody get back in order. Family doesn't work when it's out of order. Can you say amen? amen? Now, there is an order to the house of God. There is an order, a command to our families too. Command is a military term which reflects the hierarchy of authority and position and decision-making. And the same is true for the house of God. Now, I'm going to have you come over here. Right over here. Stand right here. You see this family unit here, friends? Look at it closely. This represents 60% of all families in the United States today. Single Parent families, of which the mother, the woman, is the lead of that family. It's not what God ordained. But watch this. Step up one step. Guess what? Rebecca's now in the man's place because there's no man in her home. Do you know what, friends? This don't work. This is not what God ordained. That's right. This is not God, how, how, the, how the anointing flows from the top to the bottom. It's an out-of-order home. Rebecca, step down one. If she stays in her place, this is what God promises. Step down one. He says, I'll be a father to the fatherless. I'll be a husband to the husbandless. You may think, Preacher, you have no idea what you're talking about. I do, because my daughter is a single parent, single family parent. She's, she's a single parent family, and she is a widow, and she has to struggle every day not to step up into the rightful place that the man should hold in her family. And she allows God to be the father to the fatherless, a husband to the husbandless. And this is when it works right. Can you say amen, church? Amen. Ladies, don't try to steal God's place. Stand up on up here. Don't try to take his position because, see, that position wasn't built for you. 
You aren't strong enough to handle it. You see, you'll fail if you go up into that position because it's too heavy. God didn't create you to carry that burden. One of the reasons why a lot of women today have a very difficult time, single parent, Ladies have a difficult time developing a relationship with another man. It's because they've been trying to stand in this spot too long. Because honestly, ladies, if you're listening on, over live stream or you're here today hearing this, listen, ladies, men don't want you there. Right. Men don't want you there and neither does God. Amen. Neither does God. Wow. Here's the reason why. Because if you're standing in the place of a man, any man can look at you and see that you've been standing there way too long. You can see it on the face. You can hear it in their voice. You can see it on their, on, 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 at the, on their looks. You can, you can hear it in their attitude. They're all hard and tough. Because the woman wasn't made to be there. Let God take that position. Can you say amen, ladies? Go ahead and step down one. Don't let situations and circumstances take you out of alignment. We've got to do family right. My wife, if you'll come up here for a second, Debbie, wherever you are, I need your help because I, I don't know who else to call on. Stand next to Rebecca, please. This is another thing that we're seeing in America today. I know what you're thinking right now, but just stop. Rebecca says, man, she's my best friend. Rebecca says, man, she knows me better than, than a man could ever know me, understands my needs, understands my wants. She's, this woman is here for me. I think she's my soulmate. You can't show me anywhere in God's word that this is the model for the family today. I'm not throwing stones. I'm just telling you the facts, friends. You can't find it. You can't find this model anywhere in God's Word today. God didn't create anyone to be a homosexual. God didn't create anyone to be a lesbian. God didn't create anybody to be transsexual or bisexual. God didn't create that because if he did, then the proper family unit could never be realized. Right. It would be against his own word. If he did that, he created them male and female to function as a family, God, man, woman, children. And it's a huge lie. Listen to me. If you're listening over the Internet, it's a huge lie to say or to think that the church is so narrow-minded that Christians are haters of homosexuals. It's not true. Because I'll say something else. If you say that you hate the homosexual, then I can't say that you're a Christian. Because God said, if you hate your brother, say you love me and you hate your brother, then the truth is not in you. You can't be a believer and hate homosexuals. You can't be a believer, wow, and hate Muslims. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a friend of mine on Facebook and you're sending me anti-Muslim stuff, stop it or I'll defriend you. Because they need Jesus too. Amen. How do I know that? It's because the, the Scripture says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. i got to finish this up. Thank you, Debbie. Would you step up here into the man's place? Here's another way that the world handles the family today when there's the absence of a husband. Little man syndrome. <laughs> this is an example, okay, bro? <laughs> I'm 60, you're younger, I don't want to get hurt. But this is little man problems. What's little man's problems? It's when mama says, baby, he's gone, so I guess you're the man of the house. 
You need to step up and take some responsibilities in this home. Ah! Uh -uh. That's not the way God created it. That's not what God wants. If there's an absence of the man, that is not what God wants you to do, Mama. Come on. I'll tell you why. Here's why. Little man isn't built for that place yet. Right. Little man has grown. Little man has a deep voice. But little man, that spot doesn't belong to him. It belongs to Jesus. Mama, bad things happen when you put little man up there. Right. I'll tell you what happens. The boy's hormones start going wild. He's the man of the house. The boy has anger issues because he doesn't know, know how to handle that position yet. He's not built for that yet. Right. He's trying to protect something that he's not built to protect yet. And now because he's a man, he's going to become sexually active because he thinks he's the man, he's all that. Uh-uh. That spot isn't for little man. Go ahead and take your rightful place, young man. Thank you. Let's step, every, all, all three of, all four of you, step on down on the bottom. Go on the bottom over there, if you would, Rebecca. Well, Dad's gone, so I guess we just have to do this all together. We'll just discuss everything and we'll agree on everything before we do anything. Because everything we do is going to affect all of us. Do you know what? This ain't right either. That's right. I said, this ain't right either. There's no anointing here. Nothing can flow. God's up, nothing can flow. There's no anointing. There's no flow here. Guys, get back in your places, if you would, please. My daughter's a single mom, and I've already told you that, and I am finishing here. When my five-year-old grandson, Frankie, grows up and uh, graduates from college, I hope that the Lord will bless my daughter with a man. <laughs> Only a grandparent can understand those words. I love that little guy. And when this happens, I hope this is what I hear from my daughter's mouth. God, how do you feel about this guy? Is he the right guy? God, he's cute. <laughs> he's cute to you, right? He's cute. But God, is he your choice for me? And if God doesn't say yes, then she's not, she needs to say you're out of here. Right. You ain't getting in the house. Because I want this house to be in order and to reflect God's glory and to have his anointing come. Come on back over and stand. And... This is how it's supposed to work. This is how the anointing flows from the top to the bottom. We don't have time to talk about the, the anointing that's upon the kid's life, but it's great, it's powerful. Can you give it up for the family this morning? Thank you. So here it is, John 10.10. 10. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life comes to us when we do family right. Can't happen any other way. When we do family right. A house that's out of order will never experience the John 10.10 10 life. Never. How can I be sure? Because I'm a product of a house, a home that was out of order. My father wasn't saved, my mother wasn't saved, my siblings weren't saved, and I didn't begin the John 10, 10 life until I gave my life to Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and that's what you need to do to start the John 10, 10 life because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Maybe you're here and you've been doing family but not doing it exactly right. As a result, now there's some struggles, there's issues, there's things that have happened in your family. 
Don't just say, well, my family's all grown up and I've made a mess of that. It's over with. You know what? God is a God of second chances. I'm so glad he's a God of second chances. Because I'm standing here before you, I know I've messed up as a father in times past. But our God's a God of second chances, and you don't have to look and say right off your family and say, it's all over, it's not going to happen. My kids are grown up and they're gone. There's no chance for me to rebuild that. There is, because our God is a God of second chances. So let me just ask you right now, as we're sitting here as the family of God, maybe you're here in this place or you're listening via the internet, and you haven't been doing family exactly right, and you want to go back, and you want to revisit, you want God to do something, you want God to give you that second chance with your family. You say, well, I'm divorced and things are, no, it doesn't matter, you know what? This is the God that I saw make the blind see on our trip in the Dominican Republic this last year. This is the God that I saw unstop deaf ears in the Dominican Republic. He's still a God of miracles. And he can do a miracle for you today. So if you are dealing with family issues, that's all I'm going to say. If there are issues that God has been speaking to you through this service and you want a second chance. You want to do family right. You want to set your course so that the anointing can flow this morning. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to do something really important. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet wherever you are, if that's you. You're saying, Pastor, I want to do family right. That's all I'm asking. I want to do family right. I want to do family right. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. One, two, three, if that's you. Come on. Come on. Don't be ashamed, man. We've got to get family right. If our churches are to be strong, we've got to get family right. If we're going to walk, reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got to get family right. If we don't get family right, our kids are going to go wrong. Anybody else say, yes, pastor, I want to get family right. Amen. Amen. Nate, where are you, my brother? Okay, look it. I want people to stretch out their hands to these that are standing right now. Maybe you don't know the Lord is your Savior and you don't, haven't experienced the John 10, 10 life. I gave my life to Jesus Christ and he changed my life, gave me an incredible wife and family, and here I am today. I'm not in prison like I should be or dead like I should be. I'm alive because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. God wants to do the same thing for you today. If you're here and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, would you, would you kind of wave your hand at me right now so I can pray for you? Anybody here?